I guess my journey was really shaped by a game. Uh, More specifically, one move within a game. This game was being played out at the Four Seasons Hotel in Seoul, in South Korea, in March of 2016. AlphaGo was Google's Go machine. Go is an ancient Chinese board game. And Lee Sedol, the world champion 18 times, had been challenged by Google's machine, or by the Google's machine handlers, probably not the machine itself, to a series of games that would play out in Seoul. I was watching this here in Melbourne, along with 200 million other people globally. And what happened in the 37th move of the second game changed the way I saw creativity forever. So this was a huge event in Seoul. There's $1 million worth of prize money. Uh, it virtually brought uh, Seoul to a standstill. Lee Sedol is a, is a rock star there. And it started off, as as most games do, apart from the 200 million people watching them play, the players exchanged moves until they hit the second game. The 37th move of the second game goes down in history of Go and in artificial intelligence mythology. What happened was AlphaGo the machine played a move that was later described as unique and beautiful and a move that a human could never have conceived. And most interesting for a lot of people, it was a move that had not been taught. Now, initially, Lee Sedol was stunned. The commentators went quiet. Lee had a bit of a moment. Analysts everywhere kind of paused and chatted about, you know, what was going on. Some claimed they they understood it. Some claimed that the the computer had made a mistake. But what had happened, it had produced a, a beautiful move that was so strategically significant in that game and not taught, not, not taught by its human handlers that it changed the way we think about these things. And Lee Sedol went on to lose that series. And there's a wonderful film about this, um, very empathetic to Lee's position. But this is, of course, not the first time that an AI has beat a world champion of a board game. Back in 1997, Gary Kasparov was defeated by IBM's Deep Blue He wasn't that happy about it and tried to challenge Deep Blue to another another tournament, but they weren't interested. So he started to apply himself himself to to different challenges. And what he thought was, if an AI can defeat a human, what could an AI and human do together? So he invented or helped invent a concept called centaur chess. Now, centaur chess is exactly how it sounds, you know, half man, half horse. Um, The players, the team, is half AI and half human versus half AI and half human. Not literally, not in a cyborg sense, but, you know, just working with the computer. A lot of people thought that if an AI is better than a human, then surely the human will hold the AI back and that an AI plus human will lose to an AI. And it didn't transpire that way at all. The AI and human could beat the AI, it could beat the human, and still plays out that way in Centaur Chess. So here I am in 2016, I'm not there, but you know, picture me, I'm roughly somewhere there. In 2016, an advertising agency in Melbourne called The Royals that I started uh, eight years earlier, and thinking about Lee Sedol and Centaur Chess and contemporary AI, and looking around at the wonderful creative people I got to work with, thinking, what is AI and humanity, AI and human or AI and humanity or Centaur creativity mean for the creative industries? How might we work together with human and AI together for creative outcomes. I was fascinated about this opportunity for for quite a while. In fact, some I would say obsessed and went on to create a a company called Move37. So these days, there's three rough ways that people work creatively with AI. The first one is more uh, sort of production-based. So people will um, use it from an efficiency point of view to process images or sound or video uh, much more effectively than a human or old software can do by itself. But I see that as more of a a workmanlike version of AI, I guess. The second way that people are using this is a bit more interesting. There's a community of uh, creative technologists and artists across the world who are embedding AI into the the way they produce their art, the way they um, run their creative practice. So they're creating um, songs um, and poems um, and paintings and sometimes even creating paint names, often to hilarious results. I mean, who doesn't want to paint their house in Snowbonk or uh, Dorkwood or Stummy Beige. It's, it's a beautiful thing. 
or turdly. <laughs> the third way that people are really working with AI these days in, in the creative realms is more at the conceptual stage, and that is finding connections and finding combinations and finding novel ways of pulling things together. Um, like I say, right at, back at the conceptual stage, right, what's this idea about before we get into producing something? And this is the area that fascinates me the most. Because when you think about creativity, it's so much of it is a combinatorial process. You draw on your own experience and, and practice and knowledge and inspiration, um, things you've done in the past, and you try to put them together in interesting, novel and effective ways. When you work with an AI in that way, you're exposed to a whole new sea of inspiration and experiences that you haven't necessarily experienced yourself. And if you can pull that together into your workflow, workflow completely new opportunities um, arise. So this produces a few questions, and some of them have been well played out. The first one is, who owns credit for the thing that's made? Because a lot of work has gone into the algorithm, the model, the machine learning stuff, the, the data aggregation, and then an artist or a creative person comes along and uses that to create new work. There's a lot of questions about you know, who can actually claim that that's their work. The second thing is who has agency? Who's steering the ship? Because as creative workers or, or you know, creative professionals, that sense of agency is so important to our identity. So how do we ensure in these new ways of working that that's retained for the human? And the third way is really considering how do we make this work best to take advantage of um, the human capabilities and the machine capabilities so that one of those aspects doesn't take over. Interestingly, NASA has a suggestion about this. In 2003, they had a, a couple of researchers who proposed something called the horse metaphor. Now, the horse metaphor says or suggests that the way humans might work with automated systems is, is similar to the way a rider steers a horse. So, if a rider is too overtly controlling for the horse, the horse doesn't get to bring its natural instinct and natural movement to the experience. And if the horse is let loose to run, you know, do whatever it wants and long rein, obviously it's going to be chaos and neither the horse nor rider are going to get to where they're intending to go. So the horse metaphor talks about loosening and gradual feedback and gradual tightening so that the horse and rider can, can find some form of, of symbiosis in that experience. So as we think about ways and methodologies and tactics that we might start to you know, play with in the near future today and, and into the you know, next decade, we need to think about how we leverage the capabilities of both uh, human and machine in those scenarios. Here's some examples. I love to make bots. Now, bots are silly, uh, they're dumb, they are numb instruments, blunt instruments, because they don't really know anything about the context you're in. So these bots are made with context-free grammars, so they generate ideas. Here's an idea, you should make a chatbot for anime fans that, to use when they're feeling most loved. Or picture this, you're telling your boss about the time you tried to merge guilt and embarrassment, but it ended up, ended up making you feel relieved or grab a massive social dating game and throw it against the wall until inclusivity comes out. Or quietly learn everything about yard sales so that you can feel pleased. Now, these ideas are generated, and that each one of them might be interesting, might not, but now I've got sort of 80 or 90,000 of them. It's really interesting to sort of filter and curate those when you have an idea in mind. Similar to, say, using Brian Eno's oblique strategy cards where you have a problem and an opportunity and you draw up an idea and you might have an interesting um, starting point. The second way, um, which is a much more sophisticated language model, is a storytelling algorithm. So how might you poke a storytelling algorithm to get you going, to brainstorm with yourself? And so I did this the other day and I said, it's a bit like autocorrect with a bit more direction. And bear in mind, none of these sentences are in the training data. None, none, it's quite cohesive syn syntax, but none of these sentences existed. The AI has learnt the concept of what I meant. The best ideas always come from the people who have the most to lose. The best ideas always start with a bad idea. The best ideas always come from the people who are most open to change. The best ideas always come from our mistakes. Or the best ideas come out of a room full of people, and what better place than a room full of people who love to talk about memes? I'm not really sure where that one's going. Or this example, the most interesting topic for a TEDx talk about Limitless would be. 
the limits of how much information you can store on your iPhone. Now, originally, I thought that wasn't a very interesting conversation, but you know, the graphene takes it to another level. <laughs> or the most interesting topic for a TED talk about Limitless would be the use of machines to assist athletes. When used for something like running, this would be a tremendous boon to sports. These were just generated from a language model because it's understanding where you might like to go from the prompt it's been given. Or my favourite, the most interesting topic for a TEDx talk about Limitless would be the topic of the paradox of value. If you take something you own and decide to give it to someone, the value is always zero. This is the paradox of value. Now, that one's interesting on a couple of levels, because that's actually not the paradox of value. That's not what that means at all. But the AI has imagined that's what it means. And it kind of makes sense. <laughs> and finally, an example where you might like to train a neural network on a certain corpus of language or, or knowledge. And this, in this instance, the neural network has solely been trained on romance novels. So when it sees an image, all it can do is describe that image in, in the language of Mills and Boone. <laughs> now, when we think about image classification, image classification is coming a long way. It's becoming more precise. Um, but I'm not interested in the precision of it. I want to understand what the machine sees, because this might send me off in a new direction. So have a look at this image and imagine what you see, because you bring your own latent experience and knowledge. Um, you know, I see a, a traditional Japanese sport to um, you know, scantily clad men. Um, so you can imagine where this might be going for Mills and Boone. He was a shirtless man in the back of his mind, and I let out a curse as he leaned over to kiss me on the shoulder. <laughs> he wanted to strangle me, considering the beautiful boy I'd become in his boxes. <laughs> so for me, that's a wonderful experience of asking a neural network, what the machine sees. And we can train the neural networks in all kinds of language, and this stuff's progressing every day. So I want to leave you with this thought. There's a lot of uh, skepticism about job loss and automation, and those are very concerning issues. But if it's holding us back from considering AI in our creative practice, maybe it shouldn't. Because I think over the next 10 years, a lot of the interesting creative partnerships will be, will be between human and machine. And the humans who embrace that, because the machines don't have a choice, the humans who embrace that will open themselves up to unlimited potential. So what are you going to make with your creative AI? Thank you.